I would invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 90. Psalms, chapter 90. We will read the first 12 verses of Psalm 90. In honor to the word of God, will you please stand as we read. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath, we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Let us pray. Dear Lord, it's an honor to see your word, to look at it, to reflect on what you've told us, to realize that you're warning us, you're admonishing us, you're encouraging us. May we take to heart what you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there are two messages that I'd like to share today. As you know, from time to time, usually about once a year or once every two years, pastors talk about stewardship, which is giving to the Lord's work. So the first message is a very brief one on stewardship. And this is the message. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness. God has blessed our church. So just those five words, words of thank you. Then I want to go to the second message. That's going to be a little longer. <laughs> We're talking about a series called Knowing God. And we started that series back early in the year, but then we came to Resurrection Sunday, the Sunday after that, talking about the resurrection, as Bobby referred to this morning. Now we're going to continue our series on knowing God. There's so much to know about him. We read in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, the people who know their God will be strong. That's Daniel 11:32. If we know our God, he will keep us strong. We want to know more and more about him. And knowing about him is inexhaustible because there's so much in the Bible about him. Today our subject is always and forever. From Psalm chapter 90. Always and forever. God has always existed. That is clear in the Bible. And God will continue to exist forever. Always existed. He will exist forever. God is eternal. What does the Bible mean when it tells us that God is from everlasting to everlasting? That's what we have read in verse 2 of Psalm 90. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Everlasting means eternity, forever and ever. God has always existed. So there are seven facts that I'd like to have us think about this morning concerning the existence of God. Number one, God has always existed with no beginning and no end. No one created God. Notice that first word of verse 2 of Psalm 90, before, before the mountains were brought forth, or you ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before anything else, 
before God existed. Someone had to create this incredible universe, didn't they? It couldn't have just happened by itself. The Bible says that God did it. God existed before anything else did. And it was God who created the universe. Some non-believers say that God didn't create anything. It just all kind of happened by itself. It just somehow got started. Or they say that if there is a God, someone must have created him so that he could create. It's all confusing, isn't it? But the Bible is very clear. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. That's how the Bible starts. God is the creator. Before anything else existed, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He has always been that's a mind-boggling concept. God has always been. He never had a beginning. He has always been. He always started. There was no start with him. Before creation, God was there. Some philosophers say that there's got to be some kind of a big bang that started everything. If there was a big bang, it was God who created it because God is the starter of everything. Again, that word before, before anything else, there was God. God has always existed with no beginning and no end. Colossians chapter 1 amplifies on this a little bit. It actually talks about Jesus, as we know, is one of the three persons in the Godhead. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, there are some wonderful things that are said about Jesus. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before, there's that word again, before, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Jesus and God, the Holy Spirit, they're the Trinity, all have always been. This is what it says in Revelation 4, 8. Holy, holy, holy. That's like the Trinity, isn't it? Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That covers just about everything. He was, he is, he is to come. God has always existed and he's holy. He is unique, he is set apart. He's the only one who has always existed. And thankfully, because he will always exist, he's gonna make it possible for us to exist forever as well. Those wonderful words that we have in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the everlasting father everlasting the prince of peace that's our lord that's jesus he has always existed in first timothy chapter 6 verses 15 and 16 we read some amazing words describing the lord it says, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Those two verses are just tremendous verses with great, wonderful doctrinal truths about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and about God the Father himself. So we're talking about facts, about God's always and forever presence. The first one is that God has always existed with no beginning and no end. Fact number two, every created thing was designed and built by God and maintained by God. This is what we read in John chapter 1, verse 3. It's talking about Jesus, who is equal with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
All things means all things, everything. There's not a single thing that wasn't made by the Lord that has been created. Things didn't just happen. They didn't just evolve. God created them. He made them. God is the great planner, architect, and builder of the entire universe. So what was created without God? Nothing. Nothing was created without God. If God was not a phenomenal thinker, planner, builder, and fixer, nothing would even exist. There would be no earth, be no people, no animals, no plants, nothing, if it wasn't for God. Thank God we have what we have. It's only through him that we have it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says this, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So where did God get the materials to build the universe, to create the world? Well, there's an interesting passage in Psalm chapter 33 that explains where God got all the materials that he needed. Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord, and all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So when there was nothing, God said, let there be light. And let there be all of these things and everything came into being because God said, let it happen. You see something else? We can't even imagine how somebody could do something like that. Only God could do that. But we're talking about Bible facts. And this is one of the facts that God created everything. He designed it and he built it. Genesis 8.22 is one of my favorite verses because... This is what it says about some of the things that we're talking about that are relevant in our day today. 8.22 of Genesis. While the earth remains, and this is a promise that God gives to Noah and his family after they had come out of the ark. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So we're trying to figure out how we can manipulate this, and God says, I've got it. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of everything, for maintaining things. Psalm 119, verse 90, reads this way. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and it abides. What God has created is going to remain until God decides that it needs to be replaced, which it will be replaced someday. That's what it says in Revelation 21. Fact number three, we're talking about this wonderful, eternal God who is always and forever enduring. Fact number three, everything in the universe is under God's control. In the book of Acts, Paul is preaching a sermon at Mars Hill which is quite a place in Athens. And it describes some of the things that he is saying in this sermon, chapter 17 of the book of Acts, starting with verse 24. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Now, that's an amazing statement. God doesn't need anything. He provides everything for us. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might search for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our existence. God is in control. 
It says in verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. And when you think about that, isn't it ridiculous that people will make little images and they'll say, we're going to pray to this image. This, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's something they've made. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Everything in the universe is under God's control. Psalm 48, 14 says, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Trusting God, relying on him, knowing that he is in control. Some of you may remember this name, Muhammad Ali. Remember that name? He was one of the three greatest boxers in heavyweight history, along with Joe Lewis and Rocky Marciano, three great fighters. But Muhammad Ali, if some of you remember, when he was a young man, was pretty uh, arrogant. He liked to talk about himself. He said, I am the greatest. The story is told that he got on an airplane one time to take a flight. The flight attendant came by and said, Mr. Ali, you need to put on your seatbelt. He didn't do it. She came by later, Mr. Ali, you didn't put on your seatbelt yet. Third time, Mr. Ali and the plane can't take off until all the people have fastened their seatbelts. He said, I am the greatest. I am Superman. I don't need a seatbelt. She said, well, if you're Superman, then you don't need a plane either. <laughs> but God is in control, isn't he? We need God. We depend on God. The nations depend on God. God said that he is in control of the nations. In Isaiah chapter 40, we read these words, starting with verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. So God is in control. He's in control of our lives, in control of the nations of the world, and ultimately he will bring to judgment all those who are unwilling to submit to him. Fact number four, we're talking about always and forever. God has always existed, and he always forever will exist. Fact number four is God's resources are unlimited. It says in Psalm 24, 1, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. God owns everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns everything, and God, at some point, is going to give us a very wonderful new home. You know about that, don't you, from Revelation 21, where John says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. Wow, can you imagine that? Remember Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to my, you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that new heaven and new earth, I will see a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And then he goes on to say, there will be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. Neither will there be any more tears, for the former things are passed away. Behold, I make all things new. Now, some people have said, I, I can't understand how this earth can be replaced by another one. Well, God created it in the first place, so he can redo it if he wants to, can he? He promised he would. The promises of God have always come true. He's never failed in one single promise. So we're talking about always and forever. Fact number five, nothing ever surprises God. We look at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. 
That means that God can see what has not yet happened. Nothing ever surprises God. 1 John 3.20 says, For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. There's nothing that God doesn't know. The book of Romans, Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways and his judgments past finding out. So God never has to say, Oh, I didn't see that coming. Or what a surprise that is. I never expected that. That really fooled me. He doesn't have to ever say anything like that, does he? Because the Bible says he knows exactly what's going to happen all down through history because he is an eternal being who has the perspective of every single thing that has ever happened or that ever will happen. We can't understand that. We can't. Such knowledge is too wonderful. It is greater than my understanding, the psalmist says. In the book of Isaiah, we read about the knowledge of God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Nothing ever surprises God. Fact number six, God is in control of time. We go back to Psalm 90 where we read at the beginning. And this is what it says. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. It goes on to say, verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years and if by reason of strength they be 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Think of it, time is so brief compared to eternity. Even those who have lived a long life like Methuselah, 969 years, that's a long time to live. But he's gone. It's like grass. Our lives are gone. We're here for only a short time. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 5, redeeming the time because the days are evil. God wants us to make use of our time, to value our time. It's a precious gift that he's given to us. Not to waste it. He wants us to have times of pleasure and relaxation and joy, but not to fritter away our lives doing nothing. He wants us to value our time. Psalm 31, 14 says, But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. I love that word, my times are in your hands. What could be better hands than God's hands? God says, if you will give me your life, your times are in my hands. I will take care of you until it's time for you to come and be with me forever. So don't worry about anything. I've got it. I'm in control. Fact number seven, God's word will endure forever. That is so precious to us. All of the promises of God, they're going to endure. The judgments of God, they're going to happen. Whatever God said is going to come true without fail. Matthew 24, 35, we know this verse. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. We can count on the word of God. He keeps his word. He's not like human beings that sometimes forget or don't keep our words. God keeps his word. He will never fail from one single thing that he has said. We can count on God. One of the precious verses that I love in the Bible is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And it's special to me, but I think it's for every Christian. This is what it says. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, encourage with all endurance and conviction. What this is saying is that every Christian, we need to preach the word. 
There are all kinds of philosophies out there, and some churches are talking about philosophy and good works and all those things. God says, preach the word, because it's my word. It will have a powerful effect on the lives of those who listen and follow it. That's why we preach the word. We want to keep preaching the word, don't we? And teaching the word and sharing the word. Why? Because God has always been. He always will be. And because God is forever, he has said if we believe in him, he will give us eternal life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting eternal life. What a gift. What a God. How can we be more grateful? How can we describe eternity? We can't understand it because we don't know how God has always been and we can't understand how we can always live. We'll never, ever stop living. But God has promised us eternal life if we believe in him. It's eternal death or the lake of fire for those who reject God eternally. That's what it says in John chapter 5, and that's a sad thing. There was a Bible scholar who was trying to explain eternity. He said, imagine that the Pacific Ocean, the largest body of water in the world, were emptied of all of its water and filled with grains of sand. And then you took a bird, and that bird came and took one grain of sand every 100 billion years and moved it to another planet, imaginary that he could do that. Every 100 billion years, he took a grain of sand. How long would it take for that ocean to get emptied with all that sand? We can't even calculate the number of years, would it? He said, okay, so that happens. So the bird does move all the sand to somewhere else over all these billions and billions of years. Not even one second of eternity has passed during that time. Eternity is inexplicable. It's going to go on and on and on. And just think of it. We're never going to be sad again. We're going to be having a great time with God. He's going to have all kinds of adventures for us. He's prepared a place for us that's incomparable, unimaginable. He just says, love me, serve me, obey me. Do all you can for me in this life, and then you will have a life forever with me. And we want to share that life. We want to live it, share it, and thank God for it. So today we're commemorating what Jesus did for us to make that eternal life possible, his death on the cross. And we do that with the Lord's Supper. We remember the body that was shed for us and the bread and the blood in the grape juice, symbolic of the death of Christ. If you know the Lord is your personal Savior, you're invited to share with us. We'll spend a few moments in prayer. Our deacons will come, and then they will serve us. And after everyone has been served, we'll share together, first of all, in the bread, and then the grape juice. So I would like to ask that we be in a spirit of prayer, and just ask the Lord to bring us close to him, and take away all of our sins, cleanse us from every sin. Our deacons will come and be ready to serve us. Dear Lord Jesus, it's so amazing that you would humble yourself to leave heaven, to come to earth, to live like a human being, and die on a cross as a perfect Lamb of God. Only you could do that for us, and you did it. 
and we thank you. I pray that as we ask your forgiveness for the sins in our lives, I ask forgiveness for mine. I pray that each of us will take to heart this time when we remember what you did for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. After I share the words of our Lord, in honor to our Lord, let us lift the cup. Jesus said, this represents my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
Jesus took the cup also and said, This blood is the new covenant in my body, which is shed for you. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Luke, would you please lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the one more day giving us in our lives. And uh, thank you for uh, your grace and mercy upon us. And thank you for the privilege you gave us to partake in your communion. And we bless all the congregation. And we bless the people who could not join today. And we bless pastor. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The invitation from the Lord is to give our lives to Him. If there's anyone who's never trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior, we'd invite you to come and pray with one of us in the front. And give your heart to the Lord. You may desire to just come and pray at the altar or to come and say, I'd like to become a member of Bethel Church and share my story of faith. We'd love to hear that. Let us stand together as we sing our song of invitation. <laughs>